Coast. Good morning. Good happy Friday morning. Yes. Finally Friday. Weekend. Come on, y'all. So uh, back before, um, I guess, back in the fall, I told you I was going to be focusing this year on something called Uncool. So today I'm calling this Uncool Devotion. Uh, it's based on one verse out of Luke chapter 2 that happens right after the Christmas stuff. It's Luke chapter 2, verse, verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the students and for the school and for the teachers and for all people who are concerned here, parents too. I pray, Father, that today that you would call us, deeply call us to be more devoted to your Son. I pray that you would find the deepest part of us that would exchange great affection for other things and yet you would flip it upside down and help us to see that the best of all is to be in love with Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Have you ever noticed how uncool, devoted people are? I'm, I'm just saying, if you ever know somebody that's really sold out to whatever, to sports or whatever, it just it's impossible to make that kind of radical devotion look cool. I love penguins. Um, I remember when I was growing up, my dad did a lot of weddings. He was a, he was a pastor and, and a school principal. And I always used to sit there in the back and I would think, this is so dumb. I mean, they come in here and they rehearse the night before and they practice all the words they're going to say. And then tomorrow at the actual event, they get up there and they forget what they're going to say and they cry and all this. That is so sissy. What in the world's up with that? And then it came time for me to get married. And I remember I was like, man, I've been here, done that, I've seen all this stuff, I know this, I, I got this. And I, came, I got there that day and my dad was doing my wedding. And I was standing there, I was like, I'm, I, this ain't affecting me at all, I'm good, just get to ask me the questions, I'm ready to go. Yes I do, yes I do, you know, all that. And so my dad is asking the questions and he's giving this inspirational little talk to the two of us and then he says something, I'll never forget it. He looked at me. And he said, son, your great-grandfather was faithful to your great-grandmother. Your grandfather was faithful to your grandmother. I was faithful to your mother. Now you go be faithful to your wife. And then I started to cry like an idiot. <laughs> as the weight of their devotion was laid on my shoulders to carry are you devoted? Are you devoted to Jesus? I want you to notice that God uses devoted people to accomplish His purposes. He uses devoted people. There are three kinds of devoted people in the passage I'm about to read you. There's the devotion of the lowly, the devotion of the languishing, and the devotion of the lonely. Lowly, languishing, and lonely. First of all, I want you to notice Mary and Joseph, the devotion of the lowly. In verses 22 to 24, it says, Joseph and Mary took him, that is Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. They were devoted. They presented their newborn eight-day-old son to the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. The biggest church in the country, the highest church, the place where people really went to do business with God, that's where they went, to present their son. And why do they do that? Well, it has to do with the Old Testament plagues during the time of Egypt when Moses was doing all that cool stuff with that staff and there were bugs and flies and lice and frogs and all that. The very last of the plagues, remember, was the plague on the firstborn with that blood on the doorpost where the death angel passed over and took the firstborn sons of Egypt. But the truth is, it wasn't just the firstborn sons of Egypt that were cursed. It was all the firstborn sons. And the people of Israel that were there were told, you're the only ones that are going to receive an exception to the death of your firstborn, but you've got to kill a lamb and put its blood on the doorpost, and I will pass over you. The curse is still on your firstborn sons. 
And so they wrote a law that said every time a firstborn son is born, he has to be redeemed. He has to be specially consecrated or bought back from the curse of the firstborn. And so people were commanded in Israel throughout all of time to kill an animal, present a sacrifice at the temple to buy back their child from the curse. And if you're an English person like I am or Mr. Looker, Miss Bean is, there is deep irony in two young people redeeming the Redeemer, the one who's coming to redeem the souls of mankind. And so they presented him and then they consecrated him or redeemed him with a sacrifice. But here's the problem. They didn't offer the sacrifice of a lamb. The scripture that I just read says that they offered in what was keeping with the law two doves or two young pigeons. I don't know about you, but I've seen some pigeons downtown. They're looking worthy of sacrifice to me. But uh, it doesn't seem like, you know, like very like lambish. It seems like some dirty little bird. Why would you sacrifice a bird? You know, I, I don't get that. But the thing is that this was a sacrifice for poor people. Because doves and pigeons were inexpensive. And so here's two young people who come to the temple to dedicate, to consecrate their son. They can't even afford a little lamb. They have to bring two birds that would have cost like a penny. This is the devotion of the lowly, of the humble. They were poor. Mary, when she's told she's going to have the baby, she sings a song and she says, My soul magnifies the Lord. For he has done great things for me. He has brought down rulers and the powerful and exalted the humble. How did she know that? Mary and Joseph were the humble. They are and were the lowly. They were newlyweds. They were simple. They were poor. They were lowly. But they were devoted. And God uses the devoted to accomplish his purposes. I heard this story a couple of years ago about a soldier in Iraq during uh, the insurgency when we did what we called the surge and we sent more troops into Baghdad and to Kabul and all these places to really pound on the enemy. And this particular soldier was in a building with her fellow soldiers and they were clearing the building, building of all the insurgents and an IED uh, exploded, an improvised explosive device exploded and when it exploded, it took her hand. This was a female soldier. It blew her hand off and stunned her. She fell to the ground. And her fellow soldier scooped her up, ran upstairs, put her on a medevac chopper. They were about to be airlifted out. And as she was put on the chopper and the, and the medic started to attend to her, she started screaming. And they assumed it was in pain. And they thought what she was saying is, the pain, the pain. And she was holding her arm. And they said, yeah, we'll give you a shot for the pain. And she said, not pain, the ring. She'd just been married. And her left hand was gone with her wedding ring on it. So her fellow soldiers, while being fired upon, left the chopper, ran back into the building to retrieve her hand and her ring. Do you think if you were her husband you'd have any doubt about her devotion to you? You think if you were her, you'd have any doubt about her fellow soldier's devotion to her? Devoted. The lowly devoted. God uses the devoted, the lowly devoted, to accomplish His purposes. But He also uses the devotion of the languishing. There's another man named Simeon. Let me tell you about him. He's in verse 25 and 26. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ, Simeon. He is a person. Sometimes people, when they portray Simeon, they portray him as an old man, but we don't know how old he was. The scripture doesn't tell us, but I want to cast this man. If Mary and Joseph were young, maybe Simeon sort of middle-aged. And he was waiting. He was devout. He was right in the sight of God. He was devoted. He was devoted to the cause 
of waiting for something called the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for God to fulfill promises to Israel. He was waiting for God to send Messiah to set Israel free from the Romans who had them in captivity. He was waiting for the kingdom to come. And that's all he thought about day and night was the coming of the kingdom. And he had the Holy Spirit on him, and the Holy Spirit told him that he would not die until he saw Messiah with his own eyes. So he was waiting, and he was watching. He was waiting and watching in Jerusalem. And then the day came when Jesus was born. Hey, how well do you wait? Let me tell you something. If there's anything good in me, it waves bye-bye if I have to wait too long. I don't wait well. I will just tell you that if you're in front of me in the grocery store, in the express line, and you wait for the girl to scan all the products across there, and it numbers 11, I'm upset. And then if you should reach into your pocketbook or your back pocket and take out a checkbook and start writing the checkbook after they've already totaled it all up, I'm just thinking, oh, Jesus, please, you better come here right now because I'm about to get very upset. I don't like waiting. I don't like waiting for my kids. My kids, I tell them at nighttime, put your clothes out on the couch. Get your shoes ready. Get your socks ready. Pack your backpack. Put it by the back door. In fact, just go ahead and take it all out to the car. Because I don't want to turn around. I don't want any slowdowns. When I wake you up in the morning, I want to see you jump up and greet me with a, Yes, Father, thank you for waking me up. I can't wait to get up and get in there and make my breakfast and check out all the stuff that's going to happen today. Because what usually happens is it's three or four times I have to call and they're like doing that slow walk. Oh, man. Can I take another shower? I, I feel like I might need to uh, lay back down. Don't give me that. You should have gone to bed on time. Don't make me wait. I'm going to be late. Mr. Brooke will be on the sidewalk going, where's the booze? Don't you have a sense of urgency? I don't like waiting. See? I lose all my sanctification if I have to wait too long. But not him. Not Simeon. He'd been waiting a long time and he was still devout and he was still right. He hadn't lost whatever was good in him while he was waiting on whatever it is God's going to do. Hey, somebody smarter than me once said, the only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing that you had. Simeon was waiting on God. Not on people. And when he sees Jesus, the newborn baby, nobody says, hey, Simeon, Hey, that's him. That's the one right there. The Holy Spirit signals him kind of magically, subliminally, in his heart or speaking in his ear or speaking to him somehow. And he knows what he's looking at. It's not just a baby. He's looking at the fulfillment of a promise. And he kind of prays and prophesies at the same time. And he says, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant depart in peace, for I have seen your salvation and the glory of your people Israel. This is my translation of what Simeon said. That's it. I'm done. Stick a fork in me. Take me now. There's nothing better than this. The only thing you can possibly compare to seeing what I just saw is heaven. So get me out of here. I'm done. Now, I know y'all haven't lived long enough to feel that way. But there's been a couple times in my life where I've said, this is it. I'm on the highest mountain in the world. Just take me now. Can't get any better than this. Of course, then I have kids. But this is the devotion of the languishing. It's like middle-aged longing to see something good happen in your life after waiting a little while and not seeing it. The devotion of the languishing. My uncle Ken was my favorite uncle. He came to my wedding. He was a middle-aged guy. He had one son, my cousin David, who's more like a brother to me than a cousin. And right after we got married, a phone call came like a, a week after our honeymoon to say that my Uncle Ken had inoperable kidney cancer and they had very little time left to live. Now, my Uncle Ken is a, was a devoted guy. He worked as an engineer at Pensacola Naval Air Station and he was the supervisor of all the engineers at that plant, rebuilding Apache gunships and doing really important work. And I really like my Uncle Ken. But my Uncle Ken was devoted to something bigger than his job. And so he found a surgeon 
And he said, come to Pensacola and try to get this cancer out of my body. I don't care what you got to do. I don't care what the rules are. I don't care how many experimental drugs you got to use. I want this cancer out of me. I got a reason I need to live for a few more years. And he found a surgeon who flew out to Pensacola and tried to take his kidney out. And after all day long on an operating table and cutting my Uncle Kenny nearly in half, they couldn't get the cancer out. So they sewed him back up and put him on experimental drugs. And my Uncle Ken went from working 16 hours a day to sleeping 16 hours a day. He lost 80 pounds and he was transformed from this vibrant, middle-aged, highly responsible, highly respected man to a shell. You want to talk about languishing? My Uncle Ken languished for two and a half years with cancer and daily vomiting and all the other indignity that goes with cancer for one reason, he wanted to see his son, his only son, go to Auburn and be admitted into the engineering department. And he fought and he fought and he fought until his son got into the engineering department and then he died. That's the devotion of the languishing. That's the devotion of Simeon, the languishing Simeon. And God uses the devotion of the languishing to accomplish his purposes. The final kind of devotion he uses is called the devotion of the lonely. Verse 36 says, there was also a prophetess, Anna. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple. Worshipped day, night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them, that is Mary and Joseph and Simeon. At that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. You've got the devotion of the lowly, the young, you've got the devotion of sort of the middle aged, and now you've got the devotion of the aged or the old. And back in them days, if you lived to be 84, you were really old. People didn't live a long time 2,000 years ago. 30 was considered old then, and she was 84. She was a prophetess. She was lonely. She got married once. She was married for seven years. Her husband died. She stayed single. And at the time of this story, she's 84 years old. She'd been single for something like 60 years. And it says something to us about what kind of devotion she has. It says, day and night... She fasted and prayed and worshipped God in the temple. It's like her loneliness drove her not away from God, but into God. I'm going to be in the temple. I'm not going to leave. I'm just going to become a fixture there because that's where my loneliness is taken away. We're not even told that she whined about it, that she plagued everybody with her loneliness. She found her companionship. She found her husband in the church. In God, she was devoted. And she preached. When she saw the baby Jesus, she told everybody, everybody that was waiting for Messiah to come, he's the one. He's the one. That's the one. Jesus is the one. That baby, that's the one we've been waiting for. You know, I'm talking about the devotion of all these different people, and it looks like I'm talking about different people, like human beings. But really what I'm talking about is devotion to one thing. They're all devoted to one thing and one person, and that's Jesus Messiah. He's at the center point of all of this story. It's where they all agree that they're all devoted to Jesus. Devoted. How devoted are you? The very first church I ever had a job in when I was about 20 or 21 was this little Presbyterian church of about 60 people. And some of the people had been there for a long time. And there was this one lady, her name was Mrs. Todd. Mrs. Todd was completely blind and almost completely deaf. She wore hearing aids in both ears. She was about 90 when I got there. She lived a long time. She hardly ever even spoke. We weren't sure if she even knew where she was. But let me tell you what else Mrs. Todd was. She was devoted. She never missed a church service. It didn't matter whether she was sick, tired, didn't feel like it, or had a headache. Somebody went to her house and got her, and she was sitting there in church. 
When they started letting me preach there, I wasn't sure if I was even getting through, if she could hear me. I wasn't sure if she even knew my name, but she was there. It wasn't until much, much later that I found out what Mrs. Todd's value to me really was and why she was so devoted. Mrs. Todd was a single woman in her 60s when a man broke into her house one night and because there are young people here, I'll just say it like this. She was attacked and assaulted brutally and beat almost to death. They caught the guy not long after that, put him in prison. Mrs. Todd went to the hospital for a long time. And when Mrs. Todd got out of the hospital, she went to the prison and asked to see the man. And I don't know how she did this. But she said, I forgive you. And then she did something that's almost unimaginable. She decided that she would start visiting her attacker in prison regularly and reading him the Bible. She continued to do that until her attacker became a Christian. Could you be that devoted in your loneliness? Could you be that devoted if that was your mother or your grandmother? She never took her eye off the ball. It was about Jesus all the time. Is it about Jesus for you all the time? Because God uses the devoted. He uses the lonely, the lowly, the languishing devoted to accomplish His purposes. I got a confession to make. I'm tired. I'm not tired of you. I'm not tired of my work here. But I am sick and tired of my own capacity to be lukewarm. I am sick and tired of my half-heartedness. I am sick and tired of being a hypocrite and being less than everything God meant for me to be. And I, I thought I was the only one. But I've gotten to know some of you. And you know what I hear from students here? more times often than not is, you know what really wraps me around the axle and what really wears me out, what really makes me almost dread coming to school is to hear people stand up in school or do whatever they do and say that they're a Christian, but then when it comes time to make life decisions or do their life, they are anything but one. About a year ago, I just kind of said, Lord, I grew up here. I understand this. This is where I lived for 17 years of my life. Coming home every day, worrying about all the people in my class and saying, am I the only one? Am I the only one who believes this stuff? Is everybody else here because their parents make them come here? I've heard the same thing from some of you. And don't get me wrong. If you're here because your parents made you come, I'm glad you're here. I love all of you. There's not a one of you, even the ones of you who think that I think you're the worst thing here. I don't. I think there's room here for people who don't believe. But what I'm here to do today is to call some of you out. It's been too long. It's time you took control and that you took possession of your faith and your school and you stood up and been what you call yourself. If you wear the name of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, there is no half measure. There is no such animal as half devoted. There is no th such thing as a half disciple. It's all or nothing. So here's what we're going to do today. There's something that God has told me that I think I ought to be doing with you that I have not done. And so um, I'm going to pray for everybody. And when I'm done and I say amen, uh, everybody's dismissed. But for those of you who want to know what the next step is, who want to know how can I be more devoted to Jesus here, is there something I could do? Uh, Mr. Halstead and I know of something there is, that there is for you to do. We're going to help you do it. We want to find the people here who sincerely believe in Jesus and pour some of our life into you. And it won't be easy. Devotion never is. And it won't be cool because devotion never is. But it will be real. So if that's you, when I say amen, those of you who are not interested can go back to class. And those of you who want to know what that is, please join us up here, not just on the stage, 
but at the foot of the cross. Because the real character in the story of devotion is not you and me, is not Simeon, Anna, and Mary and Joseph, it's Jesus. And lest I forget to tell you, the real measure of devotion is Jesus who gave up a perfect life in heaven where he was famous, where he was rich, where he was comforted, where there was joy, where he had a really great position. He gave the perfect life up to live our life, something far less than perfect. What I'm asking you to do is to give up a life far less perfect at the foot of the cross for one that can be more glorious than the one maybe you live to this point. So if you'd like to join me and join Mr. Halstead and join each other and being more devoted, when I say amen, just come up here and I'll tell you what we're going to do. All right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this school and for the kids. I thank you for how many encouragements that you've sent through those who really want to try. We want to be the genuine article. But I pray for those who are not sure about this stuff, who see all this Jesus stuff as just religion. They can't yet see behind the veil. They don't yet get it. That's okay. That's cool. I pray that you would help us to be more gracious and more uh, patient. I pray that you would help us to wait, some of us to wait, as Simeon did, for the consolation of Seacoast. That you'd help us to wait in great expectation that you're not done with us. Our greatest things, our greatest events have not occurred behind us, but maybe they're still in front of us. So we come here today and we offer ourselves as broken and twisted and screwed up as we are and simply say, take us and use us for whatever you can. Help us to make your kingdom come to seacoast even as it is in heaven. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mr. Halstead, you want to...